Okay, so we've covered um, ray tracing. What, what we do with thick lenses, I'm going to show you some equations where there's some um, practice problems. We're not going to test you on this on, on the next test, but it, it could turn up on, on the midterm or so. Um, I'm not emphasizing this too strongly, but I just do want to point out um, how we treat thick lenses um, a, a, from an engineering perspective. I'm not expecting you to drive all the equations coming up here, but let's show you how we think of thick lenses um, versus the thin lens case. So to introduce this, um, well, well, let me introduce it here. Um, so we've developed this matrix method where we have a thickness, we have a Gaussian optic refracting surface here, M1, M3. And I did this backwards, didn't I? Oh my god. <laughs> so what we would do then is write the matrices in backwards order and, and expand that. And if we use this method, we can actually find some useful reference points in a thick lens. So it works like this. If we were to bring parallel light in from the left side of a thick lens, what the ray would do is refract twice and have a displacement before it refracts a second time. And then eventually it would cross the axis and parallel rays in would then, in the Parox approximation, all cross at F2. So we've seen this idea before for F2, but if we follow the details inside the glass, we recognize that there's this additional thickness effect which affects where the focal length will appear. So as this gets thicker, F2 requires some small adjustment. So if we look inside here, we could replace this lens for all parallel rays, and we would find that there's this imaginary planar surface at which we could apply Snell's law once. So this straight ray will bend once to that point there, and this is called the principal plane. It's called the second principal plane, which gives us F2. And if we consider then a source point on the left side that would produce parallel rays on the right, it turns out that a different principal plane comes up. And following the ray trajectories here, kind of by symmetry, you can see it would be on the other side of the lens where we can see the intersection of the incoming ray with the outgoing ray. And again, there's this imaginary surface that in lens design is called the principal plane. It's the first plane associated with F1. And if F1, if this became diverging lenses, then you know, principal plane one and two might switch places, etc. These principal planes can even be outside the lens, depending on how curved, dramatic the radius of curvature and index changes are. So they're imaginary surfaces, but they're surfaces which allows us to calculate the focal lengths of these systems. So it's going to turn out that the focal length of this lens is defined from here, because, well, that's where parallel rays bend. And the family of all the parallel rays that originate from here are, are, are um, assigned a bending only at this plane here. And we have to invent another plane to, to associate with F2. So that's principal planes. And they're part of cardinal points and planes. So H1 is a cardinal point on the principal plane 1. H2 intersects the principal axis. It's a cardinal point, And that's a plane. Um, plane um, um, that tells us how focusing works. So there's one set of rules that every lens would have. Now the interesting thing is that you can combine several lenses together, more than just one, all right? And you can replace it with an equivalent lens where there's one principal plane for left focus, one principal plane for the right focus, and then you can simplify how your ray tracing uh, um, design can take place. So it's interesting that this is not just applied to one lens, thick lens, but could be applied to a system of lenses where parallel rays coming out or coming in have these unique focal positions. And this allows us then to find these principal imaginary planes and do ray tracing more accurately. So this saves computational time once we get to that level. This is beyond what I'll test you on, but I just want you to recognize that there's a principal plane associated with the focal positions one and two. Okay, so that's one um, 
thing. A second thing is a correction for the chief ray. So we've always put the chief ray through the center of the lens, but as it gets thicker, remember we drew the plate here, there's a displacement. So the chief ray still comes out at the same angle, parallel with the incident plane, but displaced. And the displacement then is noted at the, at the um, optical axis, and this defines um, nodal points N1 and N2 and nodal planes. So there's two additional imaginary planes in the lens. There's four in total, and they're intercepting points, which are the cardinal points and planes in, in, a, in a single thick lens or an optical, a, co a combination of many optical lenses. So with N1 and N2, then, we can see the, the actual displacement. So when you're doing very precise optical lens design, these corrections are, in, of course, incredibly important. You don't want to put a CCD sensor in the wrong place, not accounting for the thickness of, of the optics. So these are the calculations designers use in packaging the optical systems together so they work um, perfectly. Okay, so um, when, um, so one question now is when will these nodal planes be symmetric? For example, that N1 from this vertex is the same distance as this distance of N2 to this other vertex. What conditions do we need to impose for this to be symmetric? Anyone guess? Go ahead. Say it one more time. Oh, no, we're not allowing thin lens. That's cheating. <laughs> Go ahead. No, um, no, because this would be true for any angle. These planes line up similarly. Yes? Same On left and right sides? So if, if the lens has the same index as the air, it disappears. OK. <laughs> well, you guys are not getting it. Come on. <laughs> but it, it requires some thinking. So how do I make this symmetric? You want to guess? The curvature should be what? Same. So make R1 and R2 the same. And I need one more symmetry condition. It's kind of obvious here that if this is air, that should be air. So these should be the same on both sides. Yeah, so if the radius of curvatures are the same, then N1, N2 points are symmetric with each other. Okay? But now these planes don't necessarily line up with these planes. So it turns out there's four unique planes in a lens system. So here is all the geometry expanded. Um, and here's what you need to know for a thick lens um, for serious design. You need a thickness. And in the paraxial approximation, you can find the focal positions, et cetera. So here's how they're measured. The focal length, for example, shown here, F1 associated with F1, is measured not from the vertex, but from this plane here, the principal plane 1. Focal length 2 is measured from principal plane 2. All right. As drawn, F2 is positive. I don't know why, but F1 is negative. So F1 negative means it appears on the left side. F2 positive is on the right side. It's a quirky thing of thick lens calculation. So if F1 were positive, you have to write it on the other side. And presumably, F2 would be negative and appear on the other side. And they'd always be measured according to where H1 and H2 was calculated. So in lens design, we need to figure out then where H is relative to the vertex. That's R. And S tells us where H2, the, sec the second principal plane, is. So there's equations coming up for those in a minute. Right, and then the cardinal points for the nodal planes are distances V and W. So there's four numbers to find these imaginary planes in a lens. There's two focal lengths. And what would you be given in the problem? This is fairly general. This is more general than in hect. This is n, which could be any number um, n. It could be air or water. n prime could be different than the incident one. And that's the refractive index of the lens. And there's the thickness. And R1 and R2. R2, as drawn, is negative by sign convention. OK, so how do we? Now find these kinds of values here. So there's a fair bit of work, and you're not responsible for this. Okay, but let me give you a hint. So, um, so the general principle is this: I have M1, M2 for thickness, M3 for the third surface, and I'm taking M3 to one order. 
So I'm going to use that idea here, but I'm going to show you an example of how you might guess what the focal length could be. So here is a trick, and, and there is, on the tutorial questions, there's, there's places where you use these ideas. So let, let's think about how to find the focus. So I have parallel light coming in, and I have M1, M2, M3, and I'm going to add M4, which has a distance x away from the vertex. So in this drawing, x is F2 minus S. Okay. So how do I find this x value? Well, I need four matrices, so I'm going to go M4, M3, M2, M1. You know how to do all of those. That's not that hard now, right? So I've taught you how to find each of the matrices. This is just the displacement in air, two Gaussian optics, and another displacement in, in the glass. And what I force to happen is I force parallel rays on the left. So how did I force parallel rays on the left? Parallel rays are theta equals zero, right? And so when I multiply this matrix through that, what do I force it to do? So I'll hide the answer. What do I force it to do by the time I get to here? What is common here? Go ahead. So I make y zero. So if I make y zero, I allow theta to be anything, and I start with y anything but zero. So these are parallel rays in, okay? And these are converging rays at this point here. So if I force this through, I'm going to find constraints in the matrix mathematics. For example, zero equals something, and out of that, I will force a value for x. And out of that, I can then unravel, um, for example, F2 minus S. Now, the amount of algebra is, is much more involved in this, because then I have to go in and find the principal planes, et cetera. So it's a fair bit of work. And I'm just going to show you the results of all of that work, just so you can see it once and, and have an appreciation for more serious optical design. So you're not responsible for the derivation. But the idea of putting zeros in here is useful to use in a matrix calculation. Right, so um, this could be just a lens maker's formula, um, the lens matrix, et cetera, and these ideas of recognizing where the rays converge, that, that is making y zero, and parallel means theta is zero. Those will be tested a couple times on, on the tutorial questions. Okay, okay so, um, so that just says what I just said. So here's the final slide here. Okay, and it looks complicated. So this allows a different index. It's the same equation. This could be any index, a lens index, and a different index from the input one. There's all the parameters, and here's the equation. So you might recognize some things that are the same, and then there's the tedious correction. So for example, the focal length F1 is drawn as negative, and it looks like what we'd seen before, approximately, you have index difference over R2, index difference over R1, and then you have a thickness correction, a smaller correction which will shift it around. So all those additional parameters are giving us a good value relative to this plane here. But now where is that plane? You need to calculate R. So you go down here, R is equal to something that depends on what F1 was, depends on the thickness, it depends on also the power of the surface. So now with this R, you can exactly calculate it. And, depend, and, and as shown, if this is positive, it's inside the glass. If R is negative, it's outside the glass. Okay. If I want to find the nodal plane to treat the chief ray, then I calculate V. And so there's another set of equations here. So it's a lot of equations. Okay. And similarly, um, I can find W and S with these equations here. And um, F2 equals F1, except for the minus sign. So as I said, that's a negative F. That would be a positive F is drawn. And it's corrected by Snell's law in a way. So if, if these two media are the same, then these focal lengths have the same magnitude and you have symmetry. Okay? But if I put water on this side, that shifts the focal length. Um, my, it would weaken it if R1 equals R2, for example. Okay. So finally, then, 
if we compare with where we were before in a thin lens, we had the lens maker's formula, we had this magnification, and F1 equaled F2, right, with equal materials on opposite sides. In this situation here, this formula is converted to this. So the F1 and F2s are not the same, and so we bring F up here, and you have an F1, F2 correction. Because F1 is negative, you get a minus sign. So there's the lens maker's formula for the thick lens with asymmetric materials on both sides. So once you have F1 and F2, you can figure that out. The magnification is also distorted when these refractive indices are different. So it's the image over object distance, but corrected by um, a kind of Snell's law correction. So um, that's why when you look into water, for example, things could look bigger <coughs> and things bend. Um, and when you change the medium of the lens, it also confuses the lens imaging condition. Okay, um, and um, that can be translated into these equations here if you use this relationship here. So that's another way to write the lens maker's formula. So in asymmetric lenses, you could also write it this way here. And that, I think, is it, end of geometric optics. So in summary, then, we've looked at ray tracing. I've tried to introduce wave views a few times in the course, right, to think about, for example, optical path lengths, et cetera. Okay, we've um, ray traced in terms of lens formulas, Gaussian optics. We've looked at thin lenses and built microscopes and eyepiece lenses. We've built telescope systems. And then at the end, I've introduced the matrix method. So the, the emphasis is more on the material before the thick lens. And um, I generally don't probe in here. I might ask some simple questions from these slides, but don't, don't really expect a lot of weight on thick lenses here. But I think it's important to be aware of what real thick lenses, um, how they really behave. Yes? So what's the coverage of the quiz? The quiz is up to um, here, this here. Up to the matrices. Sorry? Up to the matrices. Yes, yes. You might get a question on it, you might not. I'm, I, I have, I can only ask two questions and they're only 50 minutes each, so. Um, so because matrix is fairly new in the course, I probably would ask a simpler question. If it's telescopes, microscopes, it might maybe be a little more advanced. Let's see. Okay. So you think you can manage all of that, I hope. Okay. Well, we've actually pressed, we've actually covered extra material because we've got, um, like we've got literally an extra week and a day of lectures in. Um, I think the advantage is that you, you're not as busy now, you're going to get much worse, and then you have these two weeks relief coming up. So uh, you're going to be pressed hard no matter what happens. It's going to be much worse a month from now, and you're going to get a break this way. So once you get this under your belt once, get a clean look at geometric optics. And I've got some notes on wave optics next, so we're going to switch to this right now. Right now. I've got 15 minutes to introduce wave optics. Yeah, so, okay, hold on, okay, you had your break, please, we're still in lecture mode, we've got 15 minutes left, all right, you're going to get your money's worth here, <laughs> sorry, I don't know where you want to go, you might have a good date or a beer, but, you know, there, there's good and bad parts of life, you get this time back later, sorry, okay, you have a question, let, let me take questions on geometric optics. Sorry, why is that zero? Okay, so does it, maybe, maybe not all of you got this point here. So what did I do here? This is y out, right? At this position here, y out equals zero. At this position here, all those rays have theta n equals zero. So that's all I'm doing is using that outcome to force the system to behave a certain way. So when I force y out to be 0, it will force a value for x. There's only one place x that's true. So this mathematics will give me x, which is close to the focal length of a thick lens. OK? That answered your question. Good. It's a good question. Any other questions? OK. So ready to make waves? Um, I don't know how I get that up. I have to turn it off here. So let's push this up.
Okay. Okay. So let me let me take a survey again. How, how many of you um, took uh, 320 fields and waves? Okay, not very many. Okay, because I'm I'm assuming that you haven't had that background, and and so I'm going to start from scratch. But I do know that you've all had first and second year introduction to electric fields, uh, magnetic fields, and did you see the Maxwell wave equations in second year? But you don't really understand them, do you? Yeah. So, okay, well, that, we all have that problem, so. All right, so what I'm going to do, though, is build on those ideas. I, I really don't use Maxwell's wave equation in the course. I use the results of it, and I'm going to reproduce things like um, the boundary conditions. I'll, I'll tell you how they come out of Maxwell, but I, I'm not going to really run through there. I'm going to start with the, that result. Okay, but the second thing is that we also need to do waves. So another aspect of electrical engineering is I think we're not, we don't do a very good job on teaching you waves. You put a function generator on a circuit and you only look at the time dependence. Now maybe if you took fields and waves you might have done transmission lines, but where, where do you actually look at wavelengths in electrical engineering? I mean, if I watch water waves at a beach, then I have this dynamic situation where um, I can watch both time and space dependence. You can physically see the wavelength as a distance, and you see the waves coming in to the beach. So there's a time aspect and a frequency oscillation aspect. And in electrical engineering, you've got this very narrow experience, which is like sitting anchored in a boat, and you're just measuring the height of the wave at one place. Okay. And then the second thing is when we're doing electric circuits in electrical engineering, the wavelength is so big compared with the circuit, so you've got a wave which sort of comes up everywhere in the circuit, and it drops down on the circuit, right? And there's no wavelength effects. And well, we're almost at the speed of light limit where today's big chips actually can't be clocked faster because then you have, um, then you go out of phase on different parts of the circuit. So some of these wave aspects are limiting, say, chip designs today, the state-of-the-art chip designs. That's why you have quad core instead of just bigger chips. You can't clock them fast when they get too big. So, so in optics, when we oscillate more quickly, we do need to pay attention to the free space propagation. And of course, these become important in microwaves anytime we send waves over distances where interference effects can start to happen. You can have reflection of waves, um, interference of waves, and then we start to visualize, well, what, what is the wave? And we need to think of a phase front, for example, a source somewhere. And then here is an electric field, a magnetic field value. And it's moving with, say, this could be the crest. And it's moving forward. And then somewhere one wavelength away is another phase front. And it's moving forward like this. And so in standard electrical engineering, you just sit here with your probe and you do sine omega t measurements and you watch these waves go up and down. But in free space, I've got a probe and I can move on the surface, say in x and y, if that's said, and watch phase stay the same. If I move out of that plane, then the phase will oscillate with wavelengths. And when I turn time on, everything oscillates up and down. So I need you to think in 3D, in, three, in, in this space, and so, um, so it's part of this introduction and what we'll continue with next week is, is putting together that, that picture. So let's begin. So now the ideas here are, are uh, applicable to the whole spectrum, radio waves, x-rays, etc. So there's nothing um, special about optics. But in optics, we have short wavelengths against the big world, and once light is out propagating, we need to pay attention to its three-dimensional shape and its wavelength, etc. Okay, so light as an electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave is the topic here. Um, so one thing to note is that we have a photon view, so where energy can equal h nu, that is the frequency of oscillation. And a momentum can equal h over lambda. So that is the wavelength. That is the photon energy. And this is the momentum. 
So we have particle views, which is akin to the geometric optics, but they connect to frequency and wavelength views um, as such. An electromagnetic wave has, well, E is for electric field. And it's somehow synchronized with a magnetic field. But as you've seen in your past courses, you see that E and H are related to each other. So this could be E. Um, we'll use H here. So E and H are related by the impedance of the space it's in. So in light, we follow E generally, and H is just some ratio of this effect. Um, another reason physically is when electromagnetic waves interact with material, the electrons can respond to, to the um, electric field, creating polarization, which leads to refractive index changes, for example. It can lead to absorption. So the kind of physical response is more apparent to us, whereas with magnetic fields, you don't, it's hard to drive currents into materials at the kind of um, level that we would see in electric circuit analysis. And so those are sort of secondary effects that we tend not to follow, the V cross B parts. But they, they in fact, are there. Um, it just turns out that we can usually describe optics following the electric field almost fully. And really, magnetic effects are weak in the optical domain. Things are oscillating too fast that the chance to see inductive type effects is very, very small and remote. OK, now these quantities are also vectors. And they're associated with measuring forces on charges. So that's, of course, true. That's a principle that applies here as well. So if it's a, a vector, then we should really put arrows on here. E and H should have arrows. And then we can also put in x, y, and z dependence, because it doesn't need to be the same everywhere. And then, of course, it can change with time. So if you think of all the different ways this could be described, I've, I've got to go to a space x, y, z at this time. And I have an electric field pointing with some magnitude, with having a magnitude and pointing in some direction, again, against x, y, z. So this has to have a direction we follow, and it has to have a value at every x, y, and z position. And then I turn time on, and things are moving and flowing. So it's not necessarily simple to think and control all, um, or to, to imagine all those things. OK, so this. These are um, vectors. Um, in fact, let's just write it as a vector field here. OK, a vector field. OK, so we are going to follow E and not H. And I think that covers this first slide. OK, now these waves can form into any flexible shape. But to handle this, it's useful to pick a single frequency, that is a single wavelength or single frequency at one time. And then we can add them together to get solutions, say, using Fourier concepts. So generally, we look at an AC behavior at this. We don't want square wave behavior, because square wave would have a lot of frequencies present. So a single pure frequency automatically, mathematically, becomes a sine or cosine function. So electromagnetic waves then are examined at a single or pure frequency or wavelength, OK? And they are oscillating periodically. So this periodically can be in both space and time. So in time. It has a frequency and a period inverse relationship, right? And in space, what are the comparable quantities? In space, we would have 1 over wavelength 
equals uh, kappa, okay, um, which we don't, I'm not going to use in the course so much, but this would be um, a spatial frequency. That's a temporal frequency. Okay, and these are the wavelengths and um, period of oscillation in time. So then, an electric field would be some vector quantity, a magnitude and a direction. And the oscillating part, well, let's just use a cosine of something. So the question is, what is this something thing here? So in that something, we would expect to have frequency and wavelength appear in here. But we should also have x, y, z, and time appear in there as well. So if I expand this out, E0 in general would have an x component, okay? And that would have an x, y, z, and t dependence and point in the x direction. But I can also allow um, or consider that there's a y component which may be related to the x comp um, component of electric field, but it would also depend on x, y, z, and t, and it would be pointed in the y direction, and then likewise there's a z component as a function of x, y, z, and t. So this E vector has three components, x, y, z, and t, each with um, x, y, sorry, there's x, y, and z components, and each of them depend on x, y, and z. Okay? So notice the direction. Oh, and I forgot z hat here. Sorry, z hat. So it has these directions. Okay. Oh, let's just erase this. Okay, so. So we'll say more about the direction of E, but it's a vector and a magnitude. Let's go back and see what this oscillation might be about. So in time, we are quite familiar with the idea that, for example, the, um, let's say the x component of electric field as a function of time would be repeating as a cosine function and look like this. And then from here to here, I would have a period of oscillation. So there's the time dependence, the kind of thing that we do in everyday um, electrical engineering. And omega then is 2 pi times the frequency, or 2 pi over the period. And so this is the angular frequency. That's just the frequency and the period of oscillation in time. And so an equation for this would be that the magnitude of E, so I don't draw a vector on this, it may propagate along a z direction. So let's fix it at position z0. And we then have anchored our boat, for example, like, like in the ocean. And we're just now measuring how high and low the boat goes. So it's like putting a voltage probe on a circuit. We go to position z0. It could be x0, y0, z0 if you want to be 3D. And it will change as cosine of omega t plus some reference theta 1, which would define where it crosses the axis. So you're all familiar with that idea. But in the space dependence, we, of course, have an equally important part to follow. So I can freeze time and look at electric field, the x component. And it would also oscillate. And in this condition, for example, from here to here, I would define the period of oscillation over space. That would be the wavelength. And in here, I have um, k, which is the wave vector, is 2 pi over the wavelength, or 2 pi um, the, oscillation, the um, inverse wavelength. So this k is the wave vector. <coughs>
thing. And this um, Z dependence then allows me to write the electric field. Freezing time, so this is like taking a photograph of an ocean, right? You take a photograph, time is standing still, and I'm seeing the wavelength extent of electric field, and it would scale, sorry, as cosine kx minus uh, or plus theta 2. Okay, so what's important for you is to be familiar both in the x, oh sorry, I made a mistake, this is z, to be familiar in space oscillation as well as time oscillation. And mathematically, there's of course one-to-one -one correspondence, k corresponds to mega, wavelength corresponds to period, um, etc. And we can use cosine functions to describe these two things. Okay. So I've just run out of time. I'm going to um, connect these things together. So the question for the next lecture okay, is how do I combine these? How do I combine these to turn both time and space on? So you see water waves coming into a beach. Okay. What is the equation for that? And we'll answer that in the next lecture. Thanks. <laughs>